All right, awesome. Let me just pull it up on this monitor here. Can you guys hear me now? All right, great. All right, wonderful. Excellent. All right, well, uh, good afternoon. That was a good start, huh? So, um, you know what? Can somebody from IT just help me out here? Because the slides are not advancing on my computer. Is there anybody up there? Nobody? If you can just get the slides to advance up on this screen here. What's that? So they do, but I'm not seeing my... Uh, talk up on my screen. I don't think that. Yeah. You know what? I'll just I'll do it this way. Will it work that way? All right. Let's close this out. Sorry, guys. Let me see if I can pull this up again. Oh, here we go. Okay. All right, I've got it working now, guys. All right, sorry about that. All right, so uh, I've been tasked with uh, speaking to you guys about uh, anatomy of the foot and ankle and common causes of ankle pain. Uh, we'll try and make this as, as brief as possible, but this is meant to be inclusive, but by no, by no means uh, comprehensive. There's a lot uh, to talk about today, and I just want to give you kind of a bird's eye view of uh, several important foot and ankle topics. Uh, uh, I've been um, asked to talk to you about anatomy of the foot and ankle, and I do find that certain key anatomic landmarks can, can, can go a long way in terms of how you evaluate and treat patients in the office. If you know the anatomy, you can confidently refer to a foot and ankle specialist, and or treat the patient in your office yourself. Uh, so the key really is taking an anatomic approach. So when patients uh, present your office, oftentimes you will take a history and physical. A key part of the history is defining uh, the mechanism of injury. Uh, typically, uh, there's acute injuries, chronic injuries. Uh, most of the acute injuries that we see are sports related. They could be traumatic from falls, um, slips, that sort of thing. Often we'll ask if the patient felt a pop or a tear. Um, that does um, kind of key us into this being more of a traumatic type injury, a tendon tear, strain, et cetera, as opposed to chronic pain, which is more overuse, um, or insidious onset of pain, which uh, can simply be just from wear and tear. Uh, it's always important to assess the patient's ability to continue doing the tasks they were doing. Uh, were, were they able to continue working uh, or playing if they're on the uh, football field or basketball court? Uh, we always assess their weight-bearing status. Obviously, it's a more significant injury if they come in with crutches, barely able to put weight on their foot. Um, and I always want to assess whether or not uh, they took any over-the-counter oral anti-inflammatories. Have they rested it? Have they iced it? What have they done so far prior to them presenting in my office? Um, and th that's really important in terms of, all right, what can I do for this patient? Uh, we're going to go over physical exam stuff in the breakout sessions. Uh, but I find that the key to a physical exam in the foot and ankle is palpation. Oftentimes, swelling and bruising can be a nice clue as to what's going on with that patient. Just look, to, look at where the swelling is. Now, you can be fooled because sometimes swelling can travel distally, especially if somebody's been up on their feet, they've got an ankle sprain, but their toes are bruised. Uh, palpation then takes over. And, uh, so just be aware that sometimes you can get fooled, but oftentimes bruising and swelling does help you localize that injury. And the key to uh, you know, uh, making these diagnoses, as I said, is uh, knowing the anatomy. So to make it more simple uh, for you guys, I know you, you obviously treat the entire body, uh, I tried to break it down in, into kind of uh, different sections of the ankle. So anterior, posterior, and medial, and lateral. So if somebody presents your office with anterior ankle pain, uh, typically we're thinking osteochondral injury. We're thinking ankle impingement, osteoarthritis, and or syndesmotic ligament injury. Posterior ankle pain, more Achilles tendon, Achilles rupture, or what we call posterior impingement. Medial sided pain, maybe more posterior tibialis tendinopathy, deltoid ligament injury, and or accessory navicular syndrome. And lateral uh, tends to be lateral ankle sprains and or perineal tendon injury. In terms of the foot, uh, instead of anterior posterior, we think uh, dorsal and or plantar. 
Uh, forefoot stress fractures can present with dorsal pain, anterior tibialis tendonitis, which we'll see in an older patient population, and Liz Frank injuries, which is more high energy type mechanism. Plantar pain, we're all familiar with metatarsalgia, Morton's neuromas, and plantar fasciitis. More medial sided pain, hallux valgus, hallux rigidus, and or lateral uh, pain with uh, fifth metatarsal stress fractures and or insertional perineal uh, tendinopathy. So I just chose a couple of those topics to kind of dive a little bit deeper into the anatomy. Uh, we'll start with lateral ankle ligament injuries. Uh, so uh, ankle sprains, uh, in terms of incidence, they're very common. Uh, you know, there's over 2 million ankle sprains per year in the United States, costing over $2 billion in healthcare. Most commonly, it's a younger patient population, and there's no gender difference. Uh, more frequently, it's an athletic patient population. Uh, this study, uh, which looked at uh, West Point cadets, found that about a third of them over a four-year time frame actually had an ankle sprain. So it's very common in the active patient population. Uh, lateral uh, injuries are far more common than medial-sided sprains. So for the purposes of today's talk, we'll just focus on lateral uh, ankle sprains. In terms of the lateral ankle ligaments, this is a lot of words on the page here. There's three major lateral ankle ligaments, the ATFL, or anterior talofibrillar ligament, the CFL, calcaneal fibrillar ligament, and the posterior uh, talofibrillar ligament. Typically, the mechanism of injury is more of an inversion mechanism of a plantar flexed or dorsal flexed ankle, and that results in sequential injury to the ATFL, followed by the CFL, followed by the PTFL. This can also disrupt other structures within the ankle capsule, namely the uh, capsular mechanical receptors, uh, which can um, lead to impaired balance and, and proprioception after this injury. And this can also cause a stretch injury to the perineal tendons, which can lead to residual weakness, all of which may uh, contribute to a chronic instability if not identified and treated. Uh, we'll go over in the breakout sessions um, these specialty tests. There's stress testing like an anterior drawer test or an inversion or tailored tilt test that you can do for these patients to identify these, these sprains. Moving on to other ligaments about the ankle. Typically, syndesmotic ligament injuries are more anterior as well as lateral. Uh, syndesmotic li ligament injuries are otherwise known as high ankle sprains, right? We've all heard of those high ankle sprains. You never want to hear that if it's somebody on your football team, right? Because that usually means a couple weeks out, a couple weeks out from, uh, from being on the field. So while these um, are very uncommon and infrequent, they do result in more uh, treatment, uh, more significant time away from football field or, or from work, et cetera. Uh, the syndesmotic uh, or syndesmosis itself is made up of several ligaments, one being the syndesmotic membrane, but also includes the AITFL, that stands for anterior inferior tib fib ligament, not to be confused with ATFL, the interosseous ligament, and the PITFL. So those three ligaments are responsible for the majority of the stability of the syndesmosis. There's also uh, a bony stability imparted by the natural concavity and convexity of the fibula sitting in the uh, incisura um, uh, fibularis, uh, the uh, distal part of the tibia there. So what's important about the syndesmosis it, there, it, is that there's normal motion between the fibula and the tibia. The syndesmosis does allow for normal motion. Uh, however, if it's disrupted, that can lead to significant uh, difference in contact forces between the tibia and the talus. And if not identified, that leads to a lateral shift of that talus, which can lead to early osteoarthritis. You can see that in the bottom slide here. So it's important to identify these injuries. A common mechanism is more of a, a forced external rotation type mechanism. In football, you'll see it with an opposing player landing on a, a fixed foot with a rotation mechanism. Skiers sometimes can get their ski caught, and a, a rotation mechanism can occur. And this results in sequential injury to the AITFL, the interosseous membrane, uh, and the PITFL. If the, if the energy travels up uh, the proximal leg, it can sometimes exit out the fibula. And that's what's known as a mason new fracture. Some of you guys may have heard of that as well. In terms of physical exam, again, we'll get into the details of this in the breakout session. Uh, but there are some specialty tests you can do to further identify these syndesmotic ligament injuries. Um, in terms of ankle fractures, you know what, uh, Adam, I'll let you kind of handle that in terms of ankle fractures. So I'm going to skip ahead for this. Uh, we're going to fast forward a little bit. We didn't want to cover a whole lot. So let's move on to osteochondral injuries. Uh, that's a typical presentation, more of anterior ankle pain. Uh, typically, patients will present more with insidious or chronic onset. This usually is not an acute traumatic type of injury. One of these reasons these um, osteochondral injuries occur is because there's very poor blood supply uh, to the talus. Uh, in fact, 60% of that talus bone, that, that dome, is covered in articular cartilage. 
uh, but there's, there's a lack of muscle and tendon insertions, uh, which lead to limited blood supply and overall just cause a, a limited healing response within the talus itself. In terms of mechanisms of injury, uh, typically this is more repetitive traumatic type of injury, although it can occur with one acute traumatic mechanism, and that could lead to medial-sided and or lateral-sided osteochondral injuries. Other etiologies do exist, including AVN, uh, systemic vasculopathy, other endocrine and or metabolic factors, joint malalignment, and uh, genetic predisposition. But this study just showed most of these injuries do occur in what we call the mid-talar dome, which is the central portion of the talus, and medial is far more common than lateral. So moving on to posterior ankle pain, if a patient presents with posterior ankle pain, uh, often we'll think of uh, uh, several different uh, injuries, namely the Achilles tendon, but I want you all to think about something called posterior ankle impingement, uh, otherwise known as ostrogonum syndrome. Uh, there are three common causes. One may be an anatomic anomaly, essentially what we call an ostrogonum, which is an unfused posterolateral process of the talus. Uh, the other can be just a prominent posterolateral process of the talus, otherwise known as a steatal process. This can come from repetitive trauma or an acute traumatic event as well. Um, typically, the repetitive trauma is more in ballet dancers. You can see this really interesting x-ray on, on the right-hand side of the screen there where you can see the impingement happening posteriorly. Uh, her left ankle there has an ostrogonum in the back. Actually, if we use the pointer here, you can see that ostrogonum right back there. It's getting pinched in between the tibia and the talus. In terms of uh, bony anatomy, as I discussed, uh, typically, the ostrogonum and the steatal process come from the posterolateral process of the talus. Other factors uh, may play a role in terms of posterior impingement as well, uh, namely soft tissue. So what soft tissue structure do we have in the back part of the ankle there? The FHL. So the FHL enters a fibrosseous groove uh, in between the two tubercles, uh, the posterior aspect of the talus, and it could get impinged in the back part of the ankle there. There's other anatomic structures posteriorly. We're not going to get into that. Uh, today. It's a little bit more advanced. Uh, this is a good picture of the FHL as it enters into that fibrosseous sheath. A lot of uh, you are probably already familiar with Dacre veins, tenosynovitis. You'll probably hear about it tomorrow in the upper extremity talk. Uh, nonetheless, this is a very similar process that can happen in the FHL as it enters into that um, uh, sheath there. Uh, it become, it can, can become a stenosed and hypertrophic and cause uh, impingement posteriorly. Uh, lastly, I just want to discuss uh, briefly just list rank injuries. That'll present more with dorsal pain. Um, you know, what I want to talk about is not necessarily the high energy uh, list rank injuries, more of the subtle list rank injuries. These were named after uh, Jacques uh, Liz, Liz Frank. He was a uh, French Napoleonic uh, surgeon, and he saw a lot of stirrup injuries. And you know, his cavalry, he had um, you know, uh, people having their foot caught in the stirrup and then would roll forward, and they'd have an injury right where their foot was stuck in the stirrup right at that TMT joint. Um, nowadays, we see a lot more subtle injuries, uh, and it could be sport-related. These are actually termed more low-energy mechanisms. The high-energy stuff is like falls from height, motor vehicle, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's important to recognize that if somebody comes in with forefoot pain and swelling, inability to weight bear, you really want to be thinking, hey, listen, this may be a Lisfranc injury. Send them over for an x-ray. In terms of the Lisfranc anatomy, uh, there's nine bones that make up that joint, five metatarsals, three cuneiforms, one cuboid. I won't get into too much of the detail, but there's really unique shapes to some of the midfoot bones that allow some inherent stability uh, to occur. And on top of that, the Lisfranc ligament proper goes from the mediocuneiform up to the base of the second metatarsal and is essentially responsible for holding all that stuff together. In terms of mechanism of injury, typically it's a plantar flexion moment. I'm sorry, an axial moment on a plantar flex foot. So typically it's just like this gentleman here. You know, pa patients typically will go to plant their foot. Somebody will land on the back of them. That's classic for a Liz Frank mechanism. But this can occur also just from a, a forefoot getting stuck in the turf uh, and their, their cleat grabs and they have a rotation force about the midfoot. Lastly, um, Achilles rupture. Obviously, we're all familiar with this. Um, everybody knows Kevin Durant, right? Big time Achilles injury most recently. So I feel like the entire world knows about Achilles ruptures nowadays. But nonetheless, this is important not to miss. Uh, Anatomy-wise, this is the largest and strongest tendon in the body. It can handle anywhere from ten, uh, 10 to 12 and a half times body weight. Um, ruptures typically occur uh, in the distal portion of the Achilles tendon, about two to six centimeters from the insertion. 
Uh, ruptures typically occur in a very healthy, active patient population. About a third will have prodromal heel pain. The most common mechanism is just pushing off. Essentially, it's plant your foot, pop, you ruptured your Achilles. It can be something as benign as just uh, pivoting during a basketball game or, or cutting or dropping back during a football uh, game, that sort of thing. Uh, risk factors do include males. We tend to be more active in terms of the cutting, pivoting, twisting sports. Most, co most common sport is basketball. And there is um, uh, a predisposition. If you rupture one Achilles, a lot of people ask, well, well, doc, what's the risk of rupturing the other side? 6 to 26 uh, percent, depending on the literature. This is really important. If there's one kind of take-home point for Achilles ruptures, uh, a Thompson test is the way to test for an Achilles tendon rupture. It's very simple, and I think you all should know how to do it. Lay the patient prone on their stomach. Uh, squeeze their calf. If their ankle does not plantar flex, when you squeeze their calf, there's no continuity between the muscle and the tendon, and that's a rupture. Send them right over to the orthopedic surgeon. Uh, patients can actively plantar flex their ankle despite having an Achilles rupture. There's other plantar flexures of the ankle that are still intact. So if you look at what happened to Kevin Durant the other night, Somebody said, oh, well, you know, on Twitter, they said he can't have ruptured his Achilles. He, he's moving his ankle, right? It's false, right? And there's actually uh, a, a physician who said that. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I just, it's a common misconception, and it's important to recognize that. So do the Thompson test. So easy to do. Everybody should know how to do it. All right. Uh, that is the conclusion of my talk. Any questions? Awesome. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. If it's ruptured, the test will be, we call a positive Thompson test, is if the ankle does not move. So if there's a rupture and no continuity, it'll be positive. That means a retour. If it's positive, correct, yeah. So you can re-tear a previously repaired Achilles. It's uncommon. Uh, re most um, uh, re-ruptures do occur uh, within the, the first several months after surgery. Once you kind of reach five or six months, it's very unusual. There have to be a similar mechanism of re-injury. Anything else, guys? All right, we'll see you all at the breakout sessions. Your, your talk was pulled up for you. Oh, yeah, here you go. It's all <laughs>